Heavenly Father, we thank you so much this morning for allowing us to come into your house. And we ask that you open each one of our hearts and our minds to receive the blessings that you have prepared for us. In Jesus' name, amen. Our opening hymn is Open the Eyes That I May See. you, even though you don't look like you're welcome in the highway coming here, <laughs> you're all welcome. And uh, we're thankful that uh, uh, we can have a service uh, despite the pan pandemonic uh, time. Can you hear me okay? Too loud? Too loud. Okay. Maybe seated. I have a little little <clears throat> habit of keeping old magazines, and this magazine is six years old. And right here it says, "Church and open, church is open at the fastest rate in history." And they had a picture of one here, and Adventist Church being open in November of. 2014 in Guatemala 
where 144 new churches were built that year. 144 just in Guatemala. And uh, it seems that that's just uh, one little, little area of the world. But uh, in other areas of the world, it seemed like there was a thousand, let's see, more than 2,000 baptized after a first major evangelistic series in some places. And uh, they had 17 families in the Middle East where it would be hard for me to go to any place except the United States. In fact, I hardly get out of <coughs> Ohio, Pike County. Uh, tears and hugs, mass baptism in Nicaragua. It seems like uh, tremendous things are, are happening. And I, w I was really impressed with the thousands, let's see, 2,444 new churches that opened last year. Well, last year in this magazine was 19... 75, let's see, 2000, 2005. The churches that opened last year was 381 higher than, uh, than uh, 2013. And uh, that record there was 2,416 churches. And this is happening like 10 years in a row. 10 years in a row, and in the next 10 years in a row, uh, thousands, 2,400 churches uh, going by. Uh, does that give you any change of pace from driving here today? What was it like driving on, on your highway when I came here from Waverly? I followed a, uh, a couple of horses that were in a uh, trailer uh, getting a ride up the hill, going 60 miles an hour. And uh, I thought, well, uh, everybody else is going to church. Uh, they, they don't all have to have two horses to follow, but they got to <coughs> really compete on that highway if you're going to stay alive. Uh, it, it's, it's pretty uh, harrowing uh, for your emotions. And... Uh, Let's see if we've already had a children's story. Was that Nancy? Is Nancy going to have our bit children's story? Here we are. We got Nancy right here. We're all set for her. Good morning. Good morning. Happy Sabbath. How many of you have really looked forward to Sabbath today? Anybody really look forward to Sabbath? Was it a really busy week? I heard Cindy say she was, I think, looking forward to Sabbath, right? Me too. <laughs> you too, Grace? Okay. Tell me, what's some of the, what's, what do you really enjoy about Sabbath? Somebody tell me something they really enjoy about Sabbath. Rest. Rest. <laughs> Peace and quiet, is that what you said? What else? <laughs> okay, all right. Fellowship. Fellowship, okay. Now that we get back to each other and we can do that, yes, okay. All right, so when it's been a really busy week or tiresome week or a difficult emotional week, as Cindy was saying, you really look forward to Sabbath, don't you, okay? And you just say, wow, rest. That sounds so good, okay? I'm tired, and it's been a busy week for me this week, too. And so, yes, I'm looking forward to Sabbath. Well, one of the things, you know, I really like to do on Sabbath, I love coming to worship, but I like after Sabbath lunch, the nap. <laughs> I like napping. It's very good. So, what would you say? There you go. That's what Joanne tells me. Lay ministry is what she says all the time. I say funny. So... When you're wanting to relax, 
You might get ready for sleep. Okay. I'm going to get a little ready here. <laughs> Put on the old lady's duster as a, an old name for a little light robe. Does anybody else remember that duster? <laughs> okay. So I'm going to put it on. And then i got to have my pillow, okay? How about you? When you get ready to go to sleep, you want your pillow, okay? So, and now, one of my favorite blankies. i got to have it too, okay? Because I really, I really want to take that nap and be cozy, okay? So I'm just going to go over here. I, I don't even want to finish the story. I'm just going to go over here and take a little nap. Don't, don't worry about me, okay? I'm just going to lay here. Oh, you guys can get along, right? Can you get along if I sleep up here? You'll be all right? Okay. Well, I got a question for you. When you go to bed at night, and you sleep, who watches you? If Jesus is taking a nap, does God take a nap? What do you think? What do you think, Grace? Does God take a nap? Good. Let's see what the Bible says. From Psalm 121, verses 4, 5, and 6. Behold, he who keeps Israel will neither slumber nor sleep. And you know, slumber means he's not even going to get sleepy a little like we do, okay? Slumber and sleeping are a little different in that regard that you can kind of be, have you ever kind of laid as a nap and kind of you're half awake and half asleep? Well, he doesn't even do that. God doesn't even slumber. He neither slumbers or, nor sleeps. The Lord is your keeper. The Lord is your shade on your right hand. The sun will not smite you, or that means strike you or harm you by day, nor the moon by night. So when you go to bed at night, you can rest assured God is not sleeping. He's not slumbering. If you have a bad dream and you wake up, Grace, has that ever happened to you? You ever have a bad dream? Do you ever have a bad dream? No, you have? I bet your mom and dad are there for you when you have a bad dream. Well, you know what? If you wake up in the middle of the night and you're scared, you can call upon God, okay? He's always there. He's not sleeping. He's not napping. He's there. And even if you're crying, you can call upon God. Yeah, right. So I'm glad that God doesn't sleep or slumber. What'd you say, sweetie? Your call for her, right. That's wonderful. Well, God never sleeps or slumbers, so we can all rest assured at night, right, that he's going to watch over us and protect us. Could we bow our heads? Dear Lord, thank you so much for your Sabbath rest, and thank you, Lord, that we can be assured that you see us at all times, and even in the dark night, Lord, you see us and you're with us, we just but have to call for you and you're there. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Can you read that? Can you see the sign? Difficult people. story that we're talking about right now is of a family who had a car accident and their daughter was killed in it. And uh, what do you do? Can you hear me okay? Is this better? Oh, good. This, uh, what can you do to find your part in our church what can you do to, what's your talent well this people uh, their daughter was killed in a car accident 
and uh, they were to get some kind of a insurance money, and they decided that uh, uh, they would like to do something for the church for this, and they uh, had I thought that they could have a grandma's house right by the ch- right by the school where this little girl had been going to school, and they bought a house and set it up so that kids that are out of school but their parents are at work for a couple more hours would have a special place. So they called it Grandma's Place and they set it up. And uh, while they were uh, there, they were able to teach them how to cook, teach them how to uh, do uh, mechanical work, uh, they were able to bake, sew, and draw, and uh, they had fun. And uh, when they were at uh, Grandma's house, a special house just for kids for after school, uh, it worked out really well. And I thought, well, you know, we have a, a school pretty close to here, don't we? How far away are we from uh, um, the school? Around the corner? And uh, we, we have three parking places right down here. Uh, they, could, they could park there and their grandmothers can come. And uh, I'm not sure that, that that would work here, but it might work in Waverly. Uh, we still have place down there when you can't have any, any summertime activities uh, uh, any place. Uh, we have eight acres. Can you think you could get a thousand cars in, in eight acres? Ten rows of, of ten cars each. You can have a thousand, thousand cars parked right there on the north end of Waverly, right on Route 23. Looks like a good place that, that we could be. We've had that property for 20 21 years now, uh, it's time to drive in there and uh, teach them about good health. What, how would you teach good health? You can say, well, all people have choices. You can go to the doctor and he can give you a prescription or a shot. Or you can go to God's program. And God has eight, eight things he has. Sunshine, fresh air, exercise. Five more things. Could we teach them all that and have better health? My neighbor that lives across the street from where I live says she'd like to live another 31 years. Uh, she was married to a fellow that his dad was one of the local uh, attorneys in town. Uh, so she'd like to work, live another 31 years. I've already lived 35 years longer than my dad did. And so do we have the, the right prescription? Sunshine, fresh air, exercise? What else do we have besides those? New start? Wasn't wasn't New Start what we called it? N E W S T A R T, temperance, air, rest, water. Let's use those, and maybe you can live 31 years longer, just like my neighbor wants to do. Any questions? Okay. Do we have any any special prayer requests today? Are we going to write those down, I guess? Prayer requests. Jeff's coming around to get those. Um, I had a patient that's been on my mind all week, um, and she needs a lot of your prayers. I can't put too much information out there, but um she found out the night that i met with her that she has a large brain tumor um and it's 
new information for her and she's going through all of the treatment and um, all of that. So if we could keep her in prayer, um, I can't say her name, but um, if you could keep her in prayer, that would be beneficial for her. We have one like that over in Dayton that's uh, just had a stroke. Mm -hmm. Brain tumors. Can God heal, heal brain tumors? Is there anything God cannot do? Anybody else? Um, I have a friend of mine that uh, he's in the same situation I've been in. He was homeless. Um, we haven't seen him in the last four or five days, and we found out that he had a stroke at 6.45 one morning on his way to work. Um, as far as I know, he's still up at Riverside in ICU. Wow. That doesn't sound easy, not simple. Not just a band-aid there. Still in the hospital. Anybody else? Okay. One of our Waverly people here. Um, all those people that have been affected by this hurricane and and all the rain and let's Lu pray for them Louisiana that they'll get help <laughs> somehow they had pictures on what's happened in Louisiana on TV last night and they showed a place where they'd pick up the roof off of this building and set it over the other side of the trees <laughs> terrible Anyone else? Uh, yes, I've got a lady that I'm doing some work for right now that has had a very serious um, episode with what they're calling brain seizures. Um, she's on life support in Kettering. So if everybody would keep Alice in your prayers. Brain seizures, okay. Sometimes you have brain activities that are not suspected, not, not diagnosed. Brain bleeds and so forth. Tumors. Anybody else? There's Jeff looking and waiting. Let's have prayer. Thank you, Heavenly Father, for the power that you exert every day for the many problems that we have. We thank you that we can rely upon all the promises in the Bible, that Jesus can be our friend 24 hours a day. He can bless us, heal us, and give us what we need. We all need love, joy, happiness, and you are the one who is able to give us 
everything seven days a week. Help us, Lord, that we might share with our neighbors, discover their problems, help them in solving them, and follow the plan that Jesus had when he was here to mingle with people, to discover what can be done, and to do the little bit that we can do, blessed by our Heavenly Father and Jesus Christ and the Holy Spirit that's constantly in our homes. Please bless and direct me, pray in Jesus' worthy name. Amen. Is there any special music? No? Good morning. How's everybody doing this morning? It's a blessing to be here, isn't it? Just to sit back and relax for a few minutes and spend some time with God. You got to get rid of the shoes, you know. Um, just a reminder: we have prayer meeting Tuesday evening, evening by Zoom. Um, we're studying in the first chapter of Acts. It takes us a little while, but we get through them, don't we? Just takes a while. And um, wanted to. Wish Tammy a happy birthday. Her birthday's tomorrow. And so happy birthday, Tammy. Should we sing happy birthday? Somebody else started. I'm not good. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, dear Tammy. Happy birthday to you. Let's have prayer. Our Heavenly Father, I ask that you give me the words that you want me to say and open people's ears to hear the things that you want them to, to hear. Lead and guide us. And we thank you for this time with you. In Jesus' name, amen. Have you ever wondered why people put blinders on horses? Have you seen the blinders so that they can't see this way or that way? Yep, so they see straight ahead. Horses have peripheral vision. So they see this way and behind much better than forward. But if you want the horse to focus, you need to put blinders on. If you want your rows when they plow to be straight, well now most people don't plow with horses, but if you want your rows to be straight, you put, you put the blinders on so that they look straight ahead, so that they're not weaving back and forth. Or if a horse is racing and you want them to go straight forward, then you want the blinders on so that they see in front of them, not seeing what's beside of them so they can hunt for the grass to stop and eat along the way. I don't know if any of you ever feel like you need blinders on. I do. I have problems of sitting in the back of a classroom or in the back of the church because I have, then I'm concentrating on everything around me that's going on. That's why I normally like to sit towards the front so that I can focus on the person in front of me that's speaking so that I can hear what's going on. If I'm in the back, I normally don't know a whole lot when I left of what was going on because I couldn't focus on what was ahead of me. 
I have a quilt that is in a cabinet at home that I've been working on on and off for over 10 years. I don't have a focus for this quilt. I have no reason to finish this quilt. It doesn't have a purpose. It doesn't have a person that this quilt needs to go to. So it's in a cabinet at home. Every once in a while I get it out and I put it in the quilt rack and I'll do a few stitches and then I think of something else I have to do. So I'll go do something else. And it might be a week, two weeks before I even think about it again. But about a month ago, I started a project. Only this one I didn't quilt, I knotted. It had a purpose. The lady in the office with me was getting married. And she's coming back Monday. So it needed to be done by Monday. So, guess what? It didn't end up with a wall hanging. <laughs> but her living room is done in grays. And so she can put it on the back of the couch and, or somewhere in the living room and maybe use as she's watching TV or something. Or maybe on the foot of the bed to pull up. So when we have a purpose in our life, we're able to get things done, aren't we? Other times, as my quilt, it doesn't get finished. In the Bible, there are many people that had the same problem as I do. They had problems of focusing on things that they need to be doing. Moses was one of those people. For his first 40 years of his life, he lived in a, a palace of King Pharaoh because he had been saved from being thrown into the river and he became Pharaoh's son, grandson, because his daughter pulled her out of the water. Well, the next 40 years, he had run from there because of some things that he had done, because of killing an Egyptian. And so he had run to the wilderness and in those 40 years that he was in the wilderness, he found more of a purpose for his life as he was tending the sheep. He became closer to God. He had a quiet, tranquil time. And God was preparing him for something else that he probably wished God had not prepared him for. He learned from Pharaoh his first 40 years about military things and those type of things to lead out in. And then during his time in the wilderness, he learned and was able to draw closer to God. So that last 40 years of his life, he was able to lead a nation out of Egypt, out into the wilderness, and lead and guide them so that they could go to the promised land. We know there were a lot of problems there, and everybody that came out did not get to go because of the things, actually all the people that came out of Egypt did not get to go except for Aaron and Joshua. That was, Aaron didn't get to, that was wrong. And so everyone else didn't get to go that came out of Egypt because they didn't have their focus, did they? They didn't focus on God, they focused on everything else. When God sent them manna, they said, oh, but I want some meat. Can't you give me some meat? And then God sent them quail. And then they didn't like that either. There was too much quail and they overate and they got sick. They weren't focused on the things that God wanted them to be focused on. And then the disciples. Let's turn to Matthew 18, 1 to 5. 
Matthew chapter 18, verses 1 to 5. At that time, the disciples came to Jesus, saying, Who then is greatest in the kingdom of heaven? Notice what they're focusing on. They want to know who, the, who is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. And Jesus called a little child to him and set him in the midst of them and said, Assuredly, I say to you, unless you are converted and become as a little child, you will by no means enter the kingdom of heaven. Therefore, whoever humbles himself as this little child is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. And whoever receives one little child like this in my name receives me. Children, they are very special, aren't they? Until they believe in you, they follow you, they do the things. If you want, Trish was talking earlier, if you want this morning when I came in, we were talking, and she was talking about her granddaughters able to talk two different languages, speak two different languages, very fluently, and she does it without thinking. She'll talk, talk to Trish, and then she'll talk to her dad or somebody else in the room in a different language. And she has no problem doing that. Children learn. We learn most as we are younger. And so if we start training our children as small, then they learn very quickly. And Jesus said that we need to be like little children. We need to follow him unquestionably. We need to follow him and, and learn more of him. During that time, though, they weren't focused on Jesus. They were more focused on him having a kingdom here on earth to rescue them from the Romans. But then something happened. Let's turn to Acts chapter 1, verses 12 and 14. This is after Jesus' ascension. And Jesus had spent 40 days with them after he was resurrected. And it says, Then they returned to Jerusalem from the mount called Olivet, which is near Jerusalem, a Sabbath day's journey. And when they had entered, they went up into the upper room where they were staying. Peter, James, John, Andrew, Philip, and Thomas, Bartholomew and Matthew, James the Thana, son of Al Alphaeus, and Simon the Zealot, and Judas, the son of James. These all continued with one accord in prayer and supplication with the women and Mary, the mother of Jesus, and with his brothers. Once they came together and spent the time like God had wanted them to, things happened. After they spent the 40 days with Jesus, they were able to learn things that they weren't able to learn before. Um, I'm going to read to you from Acts of the Apostles, pages 26 and 27. For 40 days, Christ remained on the earth, preparing the disciples for the work before them and explaining that which heretofore they had been unable to comprehend. He spoke of the prophecies concerning his advent, his rejection of the Jews, and his death, showing that every specification of these prophecies had been fulfilled. He told them that they were to regard this fulfillment of prophecy as an assurance of the power that would attend them in their future labors. Then opened he their understanding, we read, that they might understand the scriptures and said unto them, thus it is written, and thus it behooved Christ to suffer and to rise from the dead the third day, that, and that repentance and remission of sin should be preached to his, in his name among all nations, beginning at Jerusalem. And he added, ye are witnesses of these things. During these days that Christ spent with his disciples, they gained a new experience. 
as they heard their beloved master explaining the scriptures in the light of all that had happened, their faith in him was fully established. They reached the place where they could say, I know whom I have believed. They began to realize the nature and extent of their work, to see that they were to proclaim to the world the truths entrusted to them, the events of Christ's life, his death and resurrection, the prophecies pointing to these events, the mysteries of the plan of salvation, the power of Jesus from the remission of sins, to all these things they had been witnesses, and they were to make them known to the world. They were to proclaim the gospel of peace and salvation through repentance and the power of the Savior. Before, they were to explain to people the things that, that Jesus had done while he was here, to let them know that salvation had come to them, that by Jesus coming and dying on the cross, that we have salvation and we can go home with him someday. We can follow him. And then we have Peter. Let's look at Matthew 14, 22 to 33. Matthew 14, 22 to 33. Immediately, Jesus made his disciples get into the boat and go before him to the other side, while he sent the multitudes away. And when he had sent the multitudes away, he went up on a mountain by himself to pray. And when evening had come, he was alone there. But the boat was now in the middle of the sea, tossed by the waves, for the wind was contrary. Now in the fourth watch of the night, Jesus went to them, walking on the sea. And when the disciples saw him walking on the sea, they were troubled, saying, It is a ghost, and they cried out for fear. But immediately Jesus spoke to them, saying, Be of good cheer, it is I. Do not be afraid. And Peter answered him and said, Lord, if it is you, command me to come to you on the water. So he said, Come. And when Peter had come down out of the boat, he walked on the water to go to Jesus. But when he saw that the wind was boisterous, he was afraid, and beginning to sink, he cried out, saying, Lord, save me. And immediately Jesus stretched out his hand and caught him and said to him, O oh, you of little faith, why do you doubt? And when they got into the boat, the wind ceased. Then those who were in the boat came and worshipped him, saying, Truly, you are the Son of God. When Peter concentrated on Jesus, he walked on the water, didn't he? He was able to walk out to Jesus. But what happened when he concentrated on the storm? He sunk, didn't he? As long as we stay focused on Jesus then we are able to do whatever he has prepared for us to do. Let's look at John 21, verses 15 to 23. So when they had eaten breakfast, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me more than these? He said to him, Yes, Lord, you know that I love you. And he said to him, Feed my lambs. He said to him again a second time, Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me? He said to him, Yes, Lord, you know that I love you. He said to him, Tend my sheep. He said to him the third time, Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me? Peter said, Peter was grieved because he said to him the third time, do you love me? And he said to him, Lord, do you know all things? You know that I love you. Jesus said to him, feed my sheep. Most assuredly, I say to you, when you were younger, you girded yourself and walked where you wished. But when you are old, 
you will stretch out your hands and another will gird you and carry you where you do not want to go. And Jesus, he spoke signifying what death he would glorify God. And when he had spoken, he said to him, follow me. Don't worry about what's going to happen. Just follow me, Jesus said. I want you to feed my sheep. I want you to take care of my, my children, my lambs. Don't focus on anyone else, but follow me. So all the events that had happened when they came to the upper room for those 10 days, they had a different focus. They had been with Jesus those last 40 days, and they changed during those 10 days. They focused more on other things. They focused on earnest intercession, deeper faith, heartfelt repentance, honest confession, self-examination, humility, obedient surrender to God, joyful thanksgiving, thanksgiving to God, and passionate witnessing. They changed as they met there in that room, and they became one together. But not only that, they became one with God. And then, once they had done this, they were able to receive the Holy Spirit on the day of Pentecost. And for us, we need to study and, and draw closer to God so that we can receive that same thing that they had received. A gentleman, his name was Adoniram Justice Judson. And he came to his parents, and he's told his parents, I don't believe in God anymore. And I see no reason why I should stay here anymore. I'm going to move to New York. I know that I can find greater things to do in New York. I intend to be a great man, he said. I can either be a poet or a lawyer. Anything I want, I'll be able to do in New York. His father was a pastor, and he told him, he goes, well, I'll pray for you. So he went off to New York, and soon he found that everything wasn't exactly the way he thought it would be. He wandered about the country and, and looked around. Well, one night he stopped at an inn, and the owner told him, well, the room next to you, there's a gentleman there that will probably die during the night. So if you hear any noises, that's probably what it's going to be. And so the man said, oh, it's okay. I'm tired from my journeys. It's not going to matter. I won't hear anything. And so the next morning when he went to check out, he said, well, did the man die during the night? And he said, yes, he did. He said he was a very prosperous man. And he said, the young man went to Providence College. And so he said, well, you know, that was my school that I went to. He said, who was it? And he said it was Ames. Jacob Ames was the name of this gentleman that died. And he says, well, I know him. I knew him. He was the person. He was one of my best friends in college. And he was the person that led him away from Christ. Well, during that night, he was having problems sleeping because he kept thinking, I wonder if that man's a Christian, if he knows Christ. But he didn't go over to talk to him, and he found that here that man was the man that had led him away from God. So immediately he packed up everything and he went back home. He decided that he needed to get closer to God. So he went back home, and he found a sermon by Pastor Buchanan that he read, and it was based on Matthew 2, ch chapter 2, verse 2, and that he needed to go and tell others about Jesus. And he, and he went to college, theology college, and he became a great missionary. And he went off to, and started preaching and, and telling other people about him. He went to Bur Burme, Burmese, and while he was there, there was a war going on, and he ended up in prison. And while he was in prison, 
he wrote the Bible in those people's language so that they would be able to know about Jesus. And he also wrote a dictionary with Burmese and English. He was one of the greatest of all American missionaries, according to Dr. George Smith. From not believing in God to being a great missionary, God has plans for each one of us. He has a blessing for each one of us so that we can follow him. He died so that someday we're going to be able to go home with him. He gives us a blessed assurance that he's coming back soon. Our closing hymn is Blessed Assurance. Jesus, we thank you for coming and dying for each one of us. We thank you for your blessed assurance that you are coming back soon so that we can go home for you. With you, I ask that you prepare each one of us for your soon coming, lead and guide in our lives, and help us to be a beacon on the hill to others. In Jesus' name, amen.